of the Economic uh, Development Committee to order. A quorum is present. I know folks are trickling down from the, um, the capital because there was session, so we'll get started. Folks will join us. Uh, I believe quorum is present. Rep. Igo, have you have a, had a chance to look at the minutes from January 11? Yes, I have, Madam Chair. Would you like to move the minutes? I will move the minutes. Gotcha. Uh, Representative Igo moves the minutes from January 11. Any questions? All in favor of the minutes being approved, say aye. 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 The minutes are approved. Um, our first uh, item on the agenda is uh, we're going to have a presentation from um, Dr. Bruce Carey. Um, it's Dr. Bruce Carey is, um, I love his work and I admire um, his work because he's going to ground us in equity and uh, what that looks like in building a strong economy for all Minnesotans. Uh, Dr. Bruce Carey, welcome to the committee. Could you please introduce yourself and get started? Chair Hassan, uh, Vice Chair Hansen, Representative Kosnick, and members of the committee, uh, thanks for the opportunity to share some insights on building a world-class Alana, African, Latino, Asian, Native American wealth building infrastructure in Minnesota. I am Dr. Bruce Corey, Professor of Economics and founding member of the Alana Brain Trust. And it's my pleasure to be here this morning. Uh, this week, we remember the rich legacy of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. He visited India in 1959 to learn about Gandhi's strategy of nonviolence. And while there, he was invited to the southern state of Kerala. You see, Kerala is well known in the world for the Kerala paradox. The poorest of the poor have also high literacy rates and health outcomes, unlike in other parts of India and the world. Dr. King was possibly invited to visit and experience this miracle. People were awakened about their rights and responsibilities to change their own destinies that had the positive impact on education and health. The experience had such a deep impact on him that he reflected on in it six years later. My doctoral research focused on the Kerala paradox and my conclusion was that we need a holistic approach to economic development. The same youth that was mobilized to change his or her destiny and got a master's degree became the frustrated unemployed youth with many committing, even committing suicide. We need wealth building um, activities and resources to complement the social and political mobilization and we also need spiritual healing. Today I reflect on my 35 years in Minnesota wrestling with the Minnesota paradox as Dr. Samuel Myers framed it high income with high racial disparities. I've been blessed by being involved with the Governor's Working Group and Minority Business Development in 2000, and the Governor's Workforce Development Council, and leading the economic development at the City of St. Paul, and my involvement with the Atlanta Brain Trust and other groups. And so what I've shared with you draws from this experience and the people I meet on a daily basis looking for a loan or a job or a worker or an attorney. It also builds on the great work that Chair uh, uh, Ruth Richardson with the House Select Committee on Racial Justice uh, presented uh, in the last session uh, on what can be done uh, in uh, this August body. So I'm sharing my reflection around five critical questions. Why, why now, at what, how, at what cost, and how do we assess outcomes? Let me begin first with the first question, why? I was one of the uh, Corey plaintiffs who for the first time in Minnesota history were at the table when the current boundaries of political power were framed. We asked the judges who will represent the $1.4 trillion Alana economy in Minnesota. Our map will show you how. The judges received our input and documented that input in their final order where they also asked the legislature to listen to the voices of the Alana communities. Today I make the case for political representation of these economic rep uh, interests. And if the Alana economic interests are not adequately represented, we probably will have to go back to the judges to fix it. So what are you doing here is very important. You are defining the contours of economic power through 
zoning, licensing, rules and regulations, etc. The second reason why um, uh, of the why is that Minnesota has a sordid history of racial uh, discrimination. And so on the screen above, you have a historic and legal fact reflected in the racial covenants embedded in real estate documents and in redlining that something called racism existed and had harmful impacts. The Alana people were confined to economic prisons that stifled their abilities to build wealth, especially intergenerational wealth. Today, Professor Raj Shetty uh, of Harvard using big data shows how the impacts of these economic prisons have on our ability to achieve economic and social mobility and points to two strategies, those based on improving opportunities and the others on building place. Finally, the foundational bedrock of racism is the denial of value of the human being. Denied of value, the human being becomes a tool, an animal, or an object that builds the wealth of those that control the economic prison. For three decades, I've shown that the emperor has no clothes. The Alana people have great value. I estimate that it's over $1.4 trillion that includes lifetime earnings. I also estimate that the, uh, and these are the different components of how I came up with that number, an estimate of income, an estimate of the businesses, of the lifetime earnings of the workers. Uh, I've not included in that number the potential lifetime earnings of those Alana people in the schools and universities that if they all have uh, a bachelor's degree, it'll be another $1.5 trillion in lifetime earnings, uh, their, their payment in taxes, and their global and cultural assets. I also took the opportunity at the House Select Committee on Racial Justice to come with an estimate of the economic cost of racism, which I estimate to be around $280 billion. However, this number does not capture the mental cost because the denial of value meant also the breaking of the mind to view one as less than what we are. That is why I was so inspired when my wife recently accepted the stewardship of Twin Cities Rise and there every participant is encouraged to realize a core part of their identity. I am loved, I am valuable, I am important, I am empowered. This insight was what Dr. King wrestled for six years in his mind when he spoke then at Dexter Baptist Church, he named the beast and called for his transformation. In this con policy conversation, there are two elephants in the room that we need to discuss. First, that the investment in an Alana community is a zero-sum proposition. One party wins and the other party loses. This uh, uh, myth has no basis in fact because I present results of a simulation of the Minnesota economy uh, that shows the Alana workers help generate wealth all across Minnesota, uh, over $200 billion, about $200 billion in products and services, help generate a million plus jobs, and help uh, generate $24 billion in taxes. In fact, in the last legislative session, I looked at a, a community-specific strategy, say, focusing on African Americans, and showed that there's not enough African Americans businesses or individuals to do all the work where the investment comes uh, is directed and other Minnesotans benefit from that kind of investment strategy. The other elephant in the room uh, which lacks a historic context is that uh, why should you f have a community specific program? Why can't we have a universal program that works for everyone? I wish the same people or the ancestors were around when they were building the economic prisons and the subsequent launch of universal programs that could not be accessed by the Atlanta communities. I know this for a fact because I w led the Department of Planning and Economic Development in this capital city of St. Paul and saw that the city's prime resources were accessed <laughs> primarily by those who walked the skyway in suits. Yes, we need to reshape these universal programs to be accessible to all. We also need to, current, to, to correct the underinvestment and disinvestment in the Alana communities with specific community-focused investments. So why now? As one famous saying goes, 
if not us, who, if not now, when? We are in a distinct point of history where we have a unique budget surplus that can be shaped to make progress in undoing the harm of the past and build the foundations of the future. And remember that the Alana community is paid into this surplus and I can show data to prove that fact. So some, some uh, uh, perspective on Alana businesses as this graph from Deed, uh, one of the biggest challenges is the lack of data. Can, you can't believe it, that to find current data you have to dig to 2012 where the first national study that could get dig into local data. We are living on old data and the most current data that comes out every year just focuses on employer owned businesses. We, we, but you know there's a whole lot of businesses out there that are not uh, in that stage. So there were, the last number was over 45,000 Alana businesses uh, and as this graph from Deed shows about 7,000 of them have employees and uh, there's disparities in terms of firm uh, launch uh, uh, number of firms. Alana population make over 20% of the population and but just 6% six, six of the businesses with employees. And um, uh, their they have two billion in payroll compared to 58 billion in the white firms. And so uh, relative to their, uh, their population, uh, there is a disparity. But one of the interesting parts is that there's this, these firms are growing rapidly, uh, much rapidly than the others in terms of numbers, and spread all across Minnesota. So here's a graph pulled out from the 2012 uh, economic census that shows 28 counties in Minnesota that had at least 100 Alana businesses there. And today these numbers can all be double if we just look at the national projection of growth. But the fact is that they're located all across Minnesota and the question is how well are we reaching them? The other part of uh, wealth building is the basis in which a firm can emerge or uh, be successful and that's tied to income and education and all across Minnesota from these uh, charts that are taken out from deeds uh, economic development regions you can see that there are disparities in income and they tend to also uh, parallel the disparity in educational uh, outcomes on the other side um, and so uh, you can see whether it's in northeast Minnesota or Southeast Minnesota, uh, as education in increases, uh, income increases, but also the presence of uh, a, a big chunk of uh, proportion of people that don't have a high school education and need the kinds of skills. And, and in the last presentation in the workforce committee, I shared some of the elements around the workforce that can address some of these issues. So uh, the question uh, now arises is uh, uh, why, uh, what can be done here and, and uh, uh, how do we do it? And so in this legislative uh, session of 2023, uh, we have a once in a lifetime opportunity to implement core elements of a long-term Alana wealth building infrastructure and that can grow this wealth and I mean long term because very often we put a million here or a million there but it's not consistent long term building on the, of the infrastructure. So how should this ad be addressed? I'll, I'll build up some of this part of the vision uh, uh, and talk about this concept of 100 neighborhood communities a little later. Uh, but uh, uh, what I'm uh, calling for is the creation of four long term Alana investment funds with a focus on flexible capital, land banks, capacity building, and community co-working spaces. So the idea would be that all across Minnesota there would be these nodes where this basic infrastructure is available in terms of capital, in terms of land, in terms of technical assistance, in terms of capacity, in terms of networking, uh, uh, capacity building uh, tools, and this was what will help generate wealth. Uh, such kind of infrastructure is hardly available and you can see a lot of these entrepreneurship that is happening whether it's in the cultural malls or in Main Street across greater Minnesota 
is by the in individual uh, initiative. I remember I was up in, uh, in one of the resort areas in northern Minnesota, and uh, I, the, every morning we'd have this great breakfast. So I called the, uh, the chef and wanted to talk to him, and it was an African-American gentleman. I said, what a great uh, uh, breakfast every day. Why don't you start your own business? And then I listed to him all the different resources around his neighborhood, and he hadn't heard of any of them. So how do we uh, get uh, this information how, through this system of investing in these four funds? So this, these four funds will be built on certain core principles, and that is we should leverage other resources, and this is happening a lot in, in DEEDS programs uh, that you can see. It should be accessible to all, both participants and providers. It should be outcome driven that we have to know what we are, what success looks like. It should be cultural intelligent because if you go through the different cultural malls, you'll find that the culture and the way and the type of businesses differ by different communities. And it should be flexible because we have to be able to adapt over time. And so what I propose is that in this legislative session, we allocate the funds and at the same time appoint a technical consultants to develop this fund in a box ready to go and have public hearings on how it could operate to achieve the goals of equity and accessibility. And then when this, uh, uh, the, the legislature comes back in 2020, adopt the funds and launch it right away. So. Uh, how much it costs, as I go through these funds, uh, uh, the combined would be $825 million, and it will leverage private and foundation dollars to deliver a higher return of investment as already documented by deed uh, investments. So let's talk a little bit about uh, capital is the biggest uh, challenge that our communities face. I, I know it firsthand during COVID and the launch of the PPP program, the only time that this worked for us is when the SBA had a small window of three hours where it was open for small business and that's only when people got in. So when you provide access, uh, people will take, care of the, take advantage of the opportunity. We need different kinds of loans. We need alternative finance as a whole market of people, whether you want uh, a profit sharing cooperative model or you have want uh, uh, different ways to to borrow money, uh, we need to launch those kinds of funds, equity financing, micro loans, uh, loan guarantees like uh, that can leverage larger um, investments. Very often banks are afraid to enter into an investment because they don't understand the risk and so a loan guarantee helps to leverage that risk as a banker told me, uh, and working capital. Um, uh, when we talk about this real estate fund and 500 million, it also addresses that economic prison and the redlining and the covenants that were put on property um, uh, in the past. And so what, how it could work, you can see these hedge funds coming in and buying up property or developers with big money buying up property. How could we, um, how could we uh, have these land banks that could work towards cooperative ownership models for business and housing and development and farms. And then how do we uh, build uh, capacities in different areas? For instance, Minnesota has pioneered in this concept of cultural destinations like Little Africa, Little Mekong, and so on, Rondo, where uh, the business infuses that business with their cultural values. And in doing so, they flip the whole negativity of the racial paradigm into a one that grows wealth and assets for everybody. Um, how do we uh, help people develop their products? And product development is a big deal because you're selling the same thing and you want to try to figure out how you can improve and the partnership with those uh, technical capacities of various community colleges could play a role. How do you create a virtual network because distribution is a big, marketing distribution is a big thing. So how could you say leverage Explore Minnesota or the CERT business that already lists 400 Alana businesses, how could you elevate that through uh, a virtual network that can grow businesses? Uh, how, how do you uh, create shared businesses, because uh, shared services, for instance, I get calls all the time, who's a good attorney? And then when they go to the attorney, the, the pricing, the transparency of pricing of what are you getting at and how do I know what I'm getting at 
So how do we create these accounting and bookkeeping and legal uh, networks and then uh, technical assistance to help people uh, build good businesses, good capacity businesses? And then in, in a community like a, a, a small community-based organization, a room could be transformed into a small co-working space for entrepreneurs where you'd have the basic computer and printer and mailbox and databases and innovation tools and connect it to all these funds so they become centers of, of innovation and creativity and networking and opportunity in 100 uh, places all across Minnesota. How will we assess these outcomes? Uh, well, we go back to the fund principles of leverage, access, goals, cultural intelligence and flexibility. But to that, I'm offering a sample evaluation too. This is not real information. This is just some example of where you might plot the actual versus the, the, the real. And I've included uh, people uh, to see these uh, people within these demographics. Is our entrepreneurship reaching this Alana single mom with kids? Is it reaching the new immigrant and refugee? It's, is it reaching the person which, uh, uh, who's working as a second chance hire or re-entry worker? Is it reaching the college grad? Is it affecting our youth, impacting our youth? How do we know our programs are effective uh, in a boots to the ground strategy? So those are some ideas I have before you and I hope that you consider them and I am here available um, um, beyond this room to have conversation on how we can create this world-class uh, wealth building infrastructure in Minnesota that will really explode. Right now, our growth has not exploded because we've stifled it. And how do we unleash that? And I know with your leadership, Chair Hassan, and the committee members, it can be done. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Bruce Corey, for this informa uh, informative presentation with Minnesota leading the nation in disparities and our demographics changing every day, we owe it to our communities across the state to improve the lives of everyone. Uh, that includes immigrants, that includes uh, people of color, black indi and indigenous. A community that thrives together should be our optimal goal. Information is powerful, right? And what you don't know doesn't exist. If our communities don't get the right access to the right information and the right resources, then they will be forever disinvested or underinvested. So I'm extremely thankful and appreciate your contribution to our committee to ground us in equity and what we need to do. As it's our responsibility as the elected <laughs> leaders of this state to look at what's working and fix what's broken or add what's missing. Um, member questions, I, Representative Fetisa would turn. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Dr. Corey, for this presentation. Um, I was hoping that you could talk a little bit more in depth about the different, um, the capital fund. And I'm curious, specifically, as the chair is aware, um, I, I represent Eden Prairie, which has a very large Somali Muslim population. And um, over, over the interim, I was meeting with, um, number of community members who want to start businesses in the child care space or have attempted to start businesses in the, in the child care space. Um, one thing that seems to be um, a, a little bit of um, a hurdle for some of our Muslim community members is the lack of halal available loans. And so I'm curious if you could talk a little bit about a the awareness of how, if people know that they can ask for them, are there providers where they like are, are specifically targeting people who need to access halal um, loans without, you know, without interest, um, or what, how that's gonna, um, how that will be a part of the, the capital fund through Atlanta. Dr. Bruce Carey. Yeah, son, Representative. Uh, thank you for that important question, and, and, and I agree, in Eden Prairie, you have a good mix of businesses at, uh, from the Alana communities across the spectrum. And, and in the specific case of alternative finance and uh, uh, products that can, uh, uh, can address the need, I don't think there's enough. Because I've been hearing um, for many years, say, uh, the first product uh, connected with neighborhood development center, Reba Free Interest, that was, I think, Wafuk uh, 
uh, a gentleman who had this experience to develop it. And, I've, and recent, more recently, I've seen an interesting product with a bank on University Avenue, how they did it. But the bottom line is that market is not served. And, and because it's not served, the, if you go to a Carmel Mall, for example, and see the energy, and you'll see that I went to St. Cloud, I went to Rochester, there is all that entrepreneurial energy. They're buying uh, trucks, they're buying, uh, working on businesses, but where to get the capital? And if we really want to unleash that uh, energy here, um, developing and offering a product, and even it, it, a profit-sharing concept is universally accepted and becoming increasingly important in the group of co-ops, for instance. So there is kind of a, a more broader uh, need, too, of offering a different way of financing businesses for us to be effective, and I hope uh, this committee would launch uh, a product like that uh, of space so that we can unleash that energy. Thank you. A follow-up? Any other members? Well, thank you, Dr. Bruce Carey. We appreciate your contribution. And um, we will. We have a lot to think about. You gave us a lot, so thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Committee members. Up next, we have a quick presentation from uh, Minnesota Public uh, Facilities Authority. Uh, I believe Jeff Freeman, who is the Executive Director, is here with us. <laughs> Freeman, welcome to committee. Would you introduce yourself for the record and proceed? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Good morning. My name is Jeff Freeman. I'm the Executive Director of the Minnesota Public Facilities Authority. We are the state agency that uh, provides uh, financing to cities for water infrastructure as our primary uh, function. And uh, PFA provides financing for all types of municipal wastewater and drinking water infrastructure to uh, protect water quality and public health. These projects um, range from replacing aging infrastructure, underground pipes, old treatment plants, uh, system improvements for better efficiency and service, uh, upgrading treatment facilities to improve water quality, and service extensions to serve existing needs. These are basic water infrastructure systems that all cities, virtually all cities, um, own and are responsible for operating and maintaining to provide dependable service to their residents and businesses. This is one of the most important functions that local governments have is maintaining uh, providing uh, clean water, providing drinking water, safe drinking water, and, and uh, appropriately dealing with wastewater in their community. It's essential for um, residents and uh, business development in the communities. We uh, manage three primary uh, main programs, uh, and the largest by far is the Clean Water and Drinking Water State Revolving Funds. These are uh, low interest loan programs. Since the beginning of the PFA in 1990, we've made uh, 4.4 billion in loans to cities for these water infrastructure projects. These are our st strict loans. As we essentially are purchasing city uh, general obligation notes, uh, similar to a city going to the private bond market to finance projects with tax exempt bonds. However, we're able to do it with uh, rates that are significantly below the interest rate that uh, cities would pay on uh, in normal uh, private market financing. Um, the loans are supported by uh, annual federal and state matching funds, uh, and then all of the loan repayments revolve back to make new loans. A small portion of the federal dollars is available as um, principal forgiveness grants for disadvantaged communities and for green infrastructure projects. 
we also then manage two grant programs. The uh, WIF program, Water Infrastructure Fund, provides grants to cities to replace aging infrastructure that would otherwise be unaffordable for the city to do with just the loan funds. Uh, these grants are packaged with our PFA loans or we also partner with USDA Rural Development that is our federal partner that also provides loans and grants for small rural communities and some of the WIF grants are used to match funds with uh, USDA Rural Development. Then there's the Point Source Implementation Grant Program is specifically to help cities upgrade treatment facilities to improve water quality, to meet more stringent requirements for phosphorus discharge, um, chlorides, mercury, the various specific targeted pollutants. The, the basic PFA funding framework starts with a project priority list, actually two different project priority lists maintained by the health department and the uh, pollution control agency. All cities, all projects must be ranked on the prior priority list, which rank projects based on age and condition of existing infrastructure, as well as water quality and public health criteria. Uh, last year we made about 42 loans for $211 million at an average interest rate of less than 2%. Then in addition to the loans, as I mentioned, there are targeted grants based on affordability and for the treatment upgrades. Last year we made 26 grants, about $57 million. Um, as we manage these programs, one of our primary goals is to follow a stable and predictable process so cities can plan and prepare for their pro the projects. These are large, complicated systems. Even for a small city, these are complicated um, uh, systems um, that require significant pre-construction planning to prepare for the projects, uh, which can take a period of years. And so cities get on the priority list, know where they, stand, where they rank on that list based on the, those criteria, and then go about their planning and they have some confidence that the PFA financing will be there when the projects are ready to go to construction. We work closely with uh, partner agencies. The uh, health department is responsible for the uh, technical side of drinking water projects and the pollution control agency works with the wastewater and stormwater projects. Their roles are to prepare those project priority lists that I mentioned, which are roughly a five year project pipeline. Uh, they do the technical engineering reviews on preliminary planning documentation as well as the uh, actual construction plans and specifications, they, and they do the environmental reviews that are required. And when all of that is done, they provide a certification to my agency that the project has met all the technical requirements and on that side is, is ready for funding. Um, my agency prepares what's called an annual intended use plan, which is um, the list of projects that are uh, ready for construction and, uh, and eligible to apply for funding in a particular year. There's a fundable range. We do have more demand than we have available funds. And so based on the project priority list and the readiness to proceed of the project, we identify a fundable range for projects that are um, expected to be funded each year. We do the financial and credit review um, we work with cities to make sure that they have the um, revenue, the user rates, because cities operate these systems as enterprise funds. And all the users pay typically a monthly user bill, your water bill and your wastewater and drinking water, a lot of times they're combined, but we look at them as separate financing. Um, we want to make sure the city has enough revenue to operate and maintain the system uh, to pay back any existing debt that they've taken for pr prior projects and then to make the repayment of the new project financing. We set the loan terms and conditions, award, disperse the funds, collect the loan repayments and do ongoing monitoring through um, 
audit reviews and other uh, compliance documentation. So the basic process, and I kind of already talked about it, cities uh, apply to get on the project priority list when they're ready for construction or when a project is scheduled for construction, they apply to the PFA for that annual intended use plan. Uh, we generally approve that intended use plan in October each year. Funds are not awarded until the projects are bid and ready to start construction. Uh, once a project receives the technical approval and certification uh, by the end, if they can get that by the end of the fiscal year, they're automatically carried over in the fundable range on the following year's list because, again, these are projects. A lot of times there's um, additional factors that cities need to prepare for before they're actually ready to start construction. And projects that don't receive that technical certification in one year then can um, reapply for the next intended use plan. One of the big changes, of course, in um, just last year was the Federal Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act. The big federal infrastructure bill will provide approximately $668 million to Minnesota for these water infrastructure systems over the next five years. Uh, the money is divided between supplemental funding for the existing clean water and drinking water programs that I just described. So we'll be able to do more projects, uh, uh, put more projects in that fundable range. Uh, about half of the money is available in the form of principal forgiveness grants, which follow the same affordability criteria as the, the WIF grants. Uh, and then the balance is available for loans, a small amount for set-asides for administration and technical assistance to cities. Uh, that does require a state match, those supplemental funds. Then there is two new dedicated funding categories, um, and you'll hear more about um, later this morning, the drinking water service line replacement. Um, a significant amount of these federal funds will help do the, those uh, replacement of uh, lead service lines throughout the state. Um, half of the money is available for grants, the other, uh, then there's some set-asides and about 35% of that is for loans with no state match. There's also a dedicated portion of money for emerging contaminants. Um, one of those that Health Department has focused on um, uh, right now is uh, manganese treatment for drinking water uh, to remove manganese in drinking water um, systems. Uh, but PFAS, of course, is another major uh, contaminant that these funds will be used to um, address. Just to give you a kind of a comparison of the federal dollars that um, we expect to receive, the. The first column shows regular federal capitalization grants, the annual funding that we received. These are the amounts that we received in 2022. Compared to the first year of IIJA funding, um, which in total is more than three times the normal federal dollars that we would receive, and it does include those, <coughs> those excuse me, <coughs> those additional categories, uh, including about $43 million a year for lead service line replacement. Um, so the, uh, this session um, to continue uh, state support for these programs, um, we will be looking uh, for um, funds. There wasn't a bonding bill last year, of course, so we're hopeful that um, there will be uh, chance for um, bonding support this year. Uh, we'll need both state match funds as well as the state funds for those WIF grants and those point source implementation grants. We also will need some policy language changes to the uh, PFA program, some technical changes to be able to fully utilize those federal funds um, on lead service lines and emerging contaminants. Uh, in your packets, I included a, um, the project list from our 20, 
23 intended use plan that was recently approved. This is the drinking water list. This list will show you, um, it'll show you kind of the, the how readiness to proceed is works together with the project priorities that are set by the health department. And the first page are the various categories of carryover projects, as I mentioned, were previously approved in a prior year, but weren't ready for financing, weren't ready for construction start yet, and so were carried over. Um, and these are all fundable automatically through under the PFA rules. We actually have funded now a number of these projects since the beginning of this fiscal year, and will continue to fund these projects. At the bottom of the first page and onto the second page are the first year applicants for the lead service line funding. And I expect in future years this list will be much longer as the um, program picks up momentum. But this first year, there's about $39 million of projects. It works out pretty closely to the funds that are available. And so we do expect to fund all of the uh, project requests for this year. In future years, as we probably will have more demand than we have funding, we will be and we have already started working with cities on uh, getting information and having them think carefully about how do they prioritize project service areas within or project areas within their own service areas. Um, and that certainly does uh, need to include and, and we've uh, communicated with cities that that needs to include um, looking at uh, equity um, considerations and priorities as well as other priorities um, such as the, the cost effectiveness that can be done when um, a city is already planning to replace the public water main in the street and they want to coordinate that work with replacing service lines. That's a, a cost effective way to accomplish this lead service line removal and so that's part of the, the picture as well. Um, you see that there's uh, some emerging contaminant projects there. As I mentioned right now, they're focused on manganese removal. And then you come to on the second page, part B, uh, new project requests not fundable at this time. So these, and it goes on for a couple of pages. Um, these are the new projects that, that cities applied for, but because we did not get the state match in a bonding bill last year, we don't have the resources to add all of these new projects into our fundable range for this year. Our hope is that uh, state match funds can be approved this session and then we would be doing an amendment to this intended use plan to uh, add all of those new project requests into our fundable range so those projects can move ahead. Um, I think I will stop there and uh, be happy to take any questions. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Are there member questions? Yes, Madam Chair. I do have one question. Go ahead. Okay. The, there was reference several times to small cities. What population bracket are we t talking about there? Mr. Uh, Freeman? Madam Chair, Representative, um, there's not a, a hard line to that. Um, the, the USDA rural development, just by their mission, focuses on small rural communities. They can go up as large as 10,000 population, but typically they focus their funds more on cities under 1,000. There are, as many of you know, there are an incredible number of uh, full-fledged cities in Minnesota that are well below 1,000 population and they have some significant water infrastructure needs. Um, and then uh, we typically, the PFA loans would go to the cities above 1,000, but that's not a hard line either. We work that out to make sure that if there are reasons why a city, it may be more advantageous for a city to be in our program versus their program, but we coordinate closely with rural development to work that out. Follow up, Representative? No, no. answer my question. Thank, Thank you. you. 
Does it seem like we have other questions? Thank you very much for. Oh. I'll just ask. A quick one. I go. There's no one else. Okay, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. So, just was going through the spreadsheet you provided here. I'm um, just seeing how much money is put out in loans. And I guess my question here is I'm looking at all these dollars, you know, uh, St. Paul got 47 million in loans. And I guess the question that comes to my head is how much did, did that affect all of the other small cities in greater Minnesota from getting loans because the city of St. Paul used almost $50 million? Mr. Freeman? Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative, uh, the, the, the answer is not, it does not affect that because of the fact, and one thing I didn't mention is the PFA does, we have authority to sell PFA revenue bonds to leverage additional loan dollars. And so the loan program is designed to be, um, to, to include both the largest cities and the biggest projects as well as the smaller cities. And we um, are able to balance that. Uh, having the bigger cities in the loan pool uh, St. Paul is a AAA rated entity and that helps strengthen our loan pool when we do go to market and sell bonds. So um, we do not, uh, there's, there's not a set limit on how much loans we can do each year. We look at the average lending capacity over the long term of the fund compared to the requests each year and balance that out. And um, it so, when we have a large project such as St. Paul, you can see the total project is $189 million or probably close to $200 million right now. We've, we made last year, we made a $46 million loan. So we're making these loans based on annual cash flow needs. We spread that, uh, that large dollar amount out over a period of years so that it doesn't have such a big impact to the fund and doing those various things, we're able to um, fund a larger project such as St. Paul. We funded a number for Minneapolis as well. On the, on the wastewater side, we um, fund roughly $50 million a year to the Met Council that provides wastewater service to the whole area. So we're able to, to handle those larger projects and do all of the, the smaller communities. Follow up, Representative? Yes, thank you for that. Like I said, it was good to get that kind of clarification out there that you're able to balance it all out. I was just, uh, my concern was is that there's only so much you could lend a year based on your books. You know, I just wouldn't want to have that uh, discrepancy because uh, obviously all of our cities matter when we're addressing these concerns. So thank you for walking me through that. I'm sure the rest of the committee appreciates it. And thank you for being here today. Thank you, Mr. Freeman, for this presentation. Thank you. All right, uh, up next we have our first bill today, House File 24. Representative Jordan, welcome to the committee. Chair moves House File 24 be re referred to the Health and Finance, Health, uh, Finance and Policy Committee. There is an A2 amendment. I believe the A2 um, puts the bill in the shape that the author, author would like. Is that correct? Yes, Madam Chair. This amendment was put together with help from both PFA and MDH to ensure our bill takes advantage of the maximum amount of federal funding and gives PFA the language they need to fund lead service line removal across the state. We've also included the full funding of lead service line removal in our state, and I ask for member support to, member support to get the bill in this shape, and then we can unpack it in greater detail. Thank you. Any discussion on DA2? All those in favor in adopting the A2 amendment say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries and the A2 is adopted. Rep. Jordan, the bill is before us. Please proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair, um, and good morning. I think it's still morning, members of the committee. I'm excited to present House File 24 which is a bill to protect Minnesotans from exposure to lead in their drinking water through lead service lines. And members, this is fundamentally a bill to protect Minnesotans from exposure to lead. And since there are a lot of new members on this committee, um, if there's one takeaway to walk with today, it is that no amount of exposure to lead is safe. Um, lead service lines are one of the largest lead sources in our Minnesota's drinking water. And often lead service lines are both publicly and privately owned and both parts of the line must be replaced simultaneously to actually avoid increasing the lead concentration in our drinking water. Uh, lead exposure to, in, through drinking water is a statewide issue and lead service lines are present across Minnesota in every community 
urban, suburban, and rural. Lead exposure through service lines is most common in lower income communities and many cities and townships do not have a comprehensive map of their lead service lines. This bill is critical not only for the health and safety of our constituents in their drinking water, but it's critical that we pass this bill now to maximize the federal funding provided by the bipartisan infrastructure law passed in 2021 by Congress and to provide the assistance that our Minnesota communities need to be in compliance with federal law. So here's how it works. The eligible recipients um, of the grant funds would include community public water suppliers of a community water system, municipalities, suppliers of other residential drinking water systems, and any applicant eligible for loans and grants under the Federal Safe Drinking Water Act. The uses for grant funding include removing and replacing these lead lines, construction related to removal and replacement, and providing info to residents on the benefits of removing the lead lines, um, and then repaying debt incurred for the above uses. Uh, grant money can be used to pay for 100% of the cost of replacing privately owned lines and only 50% of those lines that are publicly owned. Um, this bill also promotes planning by grant recipients and in particular it states that the PFA must give priority to cities, local water systems and other applicants that use grant proceeds as part of a plan to remove all lead lines in their jurisdiction. Uh, the plan should include the following, how the recipient will maximize the number of property owners participating in the program. Um, which also includes low income and disadvantaged communities. It also, um, the plan should also include how the recipient will maximize the efficient use of funds by coordinating uh, replacement of both the privately and publicly owned portion of the lines and how um, the recipient, so the municipal water supplier, the municipalities, all of those other organizations that we talked about will minimize partial replacement, which again is bad because it increases the amount of lead actually in the water if you don't replace the entire part of the line and how equity for disadvantaged groups is prioritized in the plan. Um, further, this bill requires that grant applicants that have at least 50,000 water connections must submit a workforce plan as part of their application that describes how the applicant will maximize use of um, registered apprentices and workers from communities that are underrepresented in our construction industry. Uh, like many projects in our state, this, um, the, the people who are building these lines and replacing them should be paid the appropriate prevailing wage. And House File 24 would require PFA to um, send us, the legislature, a report. There's also a big portion of this bill that is dedicated to mapping. Um, under the federal rule, all of our cities in Minnesota must have a map of their lead service lines to be in compliance with the federal law by October of 2024. So that's coming up pretty quickly. And so our cities need to make sure that they have their resources to actually map and um, do that reporting. Um, and so with that, Madam Chair, um, we have a number of excellent testifiers here um, and I'd like to move to that and discussion. Thank you, uh, Rep. Jordan. Our first testifier is uh, Patrick Shea, General Manager of St. Paul Regional Water. Welcome to the committee. Please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Yeah, good morning and uh, thank you for your time. My name is Patrick Shea. I'm the General Manager of St. Paul Regional Water Services. So um, again, thank you for allowing me to testify in favor of House File 24. Uh, we are at SBRWS or St. Paul Regional Water Services. We're a regional water provider providing drinking water to, to over 450,000 residents in the Northeast Metro of Minnesota. We are governed by the St. Paul Board of Water Commissioners. The SBRWS water system consists of nearly 100,000 service lines. 26,000 of these contain all or some portions of lead. These assets are not entirely owned by the public or by SPRWS, yet ignoring th them comes at a great public cost. As a provider of drinking water, providing safe and reliable drinking water is not just a goal, but the mission of not only myself, but the 250,000 employees, or 250, 250 employees at St. Paul Regional Water Services. In March of 2022, the, the Board of Water Commissioners directed staff at SPRWS to develop a 10-year lead service line replacement program. With the help of American Rescue Plan dollars uh, dedicated from the City of St. Paul's allocation and a grant from the Minnesota Department of Health, we piloted, experimented, and were able to successfully develop the lead-free SPRWS program over this past year. We have worked out numer numerous roadblocks, both administratively and the actual replacement process. 
What we are currently lacking for this initiative to be successful is adequate funding. Without additional state and federal dollars, the work we have done will fall well short of removing all service lines, lead service lines in our service area. As a provider of drink, safe drinking water, we strive not just for public service, but public safety and public health. This, this meets all of those challenges. It is for this reason we strongly support this bill and believe it is imperative that Minnesota makes the necessary investments to ensure lead service lines are eliminated over the next decade. I'm available now and into the future to answer any questions you may have, and I thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have uh, John Thorson. Please um, introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, for the record, my name is John Thorson. I'm Legislative Director for Lyuna, Minnesota and North Dakota. Uh, we're Minnesota's infrastructure union, representing more than 14,000 skilled construction laborers uh, who maintain our roads, highways, bridges, basic utilities that allow our communities to thrive. Uh, we're proud to stand with uh, St. Paul Regional Water Services, the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities, Conservation Minnesota, and the Operating Engineers Local 49 uh, in seeking a transformational investment uh, in our state's future that'll put us on a path for removing what the Minnesota Department of Health estimates is between 100,000 and 260,000 lead service lines in communities throughout our entire state. Uh, we strongly support the provisions of House File 24 that call for eliminating all lead service lines uh, by, 2020, uh, by 2033 and provide the funding necessary to ensure that cities can map, identify, and replace uh, both the lead pipes in public right-of-way and the 70% of uh, lead lines uh, that's in, in estimated to be on uh, private property. Uh, Lyuna members are skilled in lead service line replacement. Uh, we've worked with cities throughout the nation to accelerate the identification uh, and removal of these dangerous lead pipes in communities. And it's estimated that replacement of lead service pipelines will we'll create and maintain around 2,400 jobs annually in Minnesota over the next 10, uh, each year uh, for the next 10 years. Uh, we're excited, very excited about the career and economic inclusion opportunities. Uh, this will bring to Minnesota's construction industry through registered apprenticeship programs that increase the participation of women, veterans, people of color, and others who aren't participating to the fullest in our economy uh, today. Uh, socioeconomic impacts of a job that pays middle class wages, provides comprehensive uh, uh, family health care and retirement benefits, and offers opportunities for training and career advancement can exceed those uh, from relatively low wage, no benefit jobs by a factor of five or more. Uh, so Madam Chair, I want to thank Representative Jordan for bringing this proposal forward, encourage members of the committee uh, to support House File 24 and uh, make these critical state investments uh, to ensure lead pipes are replaced, clean drinking water is delivered to families and children across the state. Uh, this investment will increase the health, social, economic vitality uh, of our entire state, and I thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Up next, we have uh, Marty Seifert. I'm sorry if I'm butchering your last name. Uh, please introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair. I served 14 years here. I've been called worse than that. I appreciate your time and <laughs> committee's time. Um, and uh, Madam Chair, my name is Marty Seifert. I represent the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities, which is 110 rural cities outside the seven county metro area. I want to thank Representative Jordan for her work on this bill, uh, which is extremely important for protecting the health and welfare uh, of not just those uh, members in our communities out in rural Minnesota, but those uh, throughout Minnesota. Um, as all of you heard, uh, lead is a serious concern. It has been unveiled in other states. I think some of you have read about problems in Mississippi and other states where um, there's some serious health concerns from their citizens. And of course, those people want to know who's responsible for this. And their lawmakers voted out because of this. There were people who lost elections. But it's not about that, it's about doing the right thing. Um, I want to emphasize the fact that Minnesota has always been very proactive about issues like this. Um, you can't survive without basic things. Food, shelter, water, clothing 
uh, our basic human rights that we expect as Minnesotans that we're going to have clean drinking water. It doesn't matter whether you live in Roseau or Winona or Laverne or St. Paul or Minneapolis. Um, this particular bill leverages a lot of federal dollars. It is bipartisan in nature. 38% uh, of cities in greater Minnesota have over one third of their housing stock built before the 1940s. I think as most of you know, the older the home, the more likely you are to have lead in it. And you're more likely to be low income. Therefore, you're less likely to be able to afford the replacement of these lead pipes. Um, to give you an example, for those people in our communities in rural Minnesota, our incomes are lower. Looking at the last five years, on average, medium household income in greater Minnesota is $53,000 compared to 93000 in the metro area. Uh, therefore, those of you who represent rural communities, you're going to be more likely to be eligible for these dollars. Uh, and mark my word, um, if we don't get a bill like this passed, there will be issues with water contamination and your constituents will wonder, what did you do? Mm -hmm. So not only sign on to this bill, get this bill passed, do it in an ex uh, expedi expeditious manner. Um, by October 24th of 2024, we have to have a plan in Minnesota. And this is a smart bill. Uh, it leverages uh, every dollar we can get from the federal government and matches it up. And let's be real, if we don't pass this, it will fall upon your constituents. Your old ladies living in your old houses in rural Minnesota or in St. Paul or Minneapolis are going to have their water fees go up, they're going to have their sewer fees go up, or they're going to have their property taxes go up, because this has to be done. It's not a question of whether, uh, if we're going to do it, it's how we're going to do it. This is a smart way to do it. Representative Jordan's bill makes a lot of sense, and we ask that you uh, pass and advance this bill today. I'll stand for any questions. Thank you, Mr. Seifert. And I will tell you that I represent South Minneapolis, and almost every house on my block was built before 1918. So <laughs> this is a problem in, also in inner cities, and I know that mm -hmm. um, there, there has to be a lead, even if the city water doesn't have a lead. I was told yesterday, I was educated by uh, the group that's carrying this bill, that even if the city water doesn't have a lead, your pipe that brings water to your home may have lead, and you might not know it. So uh, thank you for your presentation. Uh, our last uh, uh, testifier is Greg Johnson. Please come forward and introduce yourself for the record and proceed. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. My name is Craig Johnson. I'm with the League of Minnesota Cities. Uh, for those of you who have not had a chance to uh, find out about the League yet, we are the uh, Umbrella and Associ Association of Cities across the state. Uh, we have 837 cities that participate in the League of Minnesota Cities. There's 854 total cities in the state. The uh, handful of cities that are not members of the League all have a population under 130. So very small cities who just don't regularly need our help and if we if they happen to call we'll still answer the phone but they um, so we have looked at this uh, repeatedly and for several years working with the author on this issue this is nothing new this has been a federal requirement that is coming for a long time as you heard by October of next year all cities must if they supply public water must have completed a map of where lead service lines exist or where they are not able to determine if the line is lead or not what you may also know or not know is that cities do not have any authority to go on to public property, uh, private property to do anything about this. So education of people to realize that they need to worry about what's on their private property is going to be very important as part of this. So we very much appreciate the effort that the author and the legislature are putting into discussing this and that this committee is doing. Um, we are uh, continuing to work with the author. We think that the language does have some things that can continue to be uh, fixed to make sure it works well, because our shared goal is to maximize the amount of federal funds we can get available to our residents and our citizens and our utilities to get these lead lines addressed, while making sure that the money is getting out the door as quickly as possible to do that. We don't want it all sitting on a shelf waiting for projects to get ready. We want to get it out where the projects are ready to go because we have 10 years. That's also a federal requirement. So it, if the state does not participate in this, it will be up to local taxpayers and utility rate payers to pay for it. It's going to be paid for one way or another. Uh, it's just how is that going to be played out? So 
continue to work with the author and the, the agencies and the other stakeholders you've heard from today that are working on this and we very much share their goal of uh, getting lead service line issues addressed in our communities in Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Member questions? Lead Kosnick, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair and Representative uh, Jordan. Thanks for uh, talking about this bill with me a little bit last night and sharing some information. Um, my question is, uh, you know, especially in Minneapolis and St. Paul, a higher percentage of non-owner occupied properties uh, or investor owned properties, they qualify as well is my, one of my questions and then I have another question. Representative uh, Jordan. Madam Chair, Representative Kosnick, you were very generous with your time last night. I appreciate you going over everything with me. Yes, those, um, though, that would be up to, you know, the, the city or the municipality and the land and the, the homeowner to do that. So, but they would be eligible for those of us that live in renters, you know, it would, and, or, and those of us that own rental properties would be able to take advantage of this program through the cities um, or water systems that they are subscribed to. Kosnick, you have a follow up? Yeah, thank you. So I, I appreciate that, especially I know some districts have a much higher percentage of rental properties than my districts kind of the opposite and that was kind of fascinating to me um, I know that the, we don't have a fiscal note but if you could just give us round figures how much actual state current general fund dollars or surplus dollars are, are we uh, using or is it all federal dollars um, if you could just speak to that a little bit Rep. Jordan yep thank you madam chair thank you representative Kosnick it's it's quite a bit of money. Um, it is the, the estimated cost from the state to also take advantage of the federal dollars would be 800 million. Or, yes, 800 million. And I, that's like cards on the table. That's a big number. Um, but I think that's what, that is the true cost that we will have to do to replace these lines and to make sure that the lines are placed, replaced in my community and in all of yours. Um, this also does take advantage of the federal funding um, and it is over 10 years. Thank you, Rep. Jordan. Do you have a follow up? Yes, um, Madam Chair, so it's 800 million of state dollars and what does that leverage us in federal dollars, I guess that, Rep. or Jordan. is that included in there, I hope? Rep. Jordan, go ahead. Madam Chair, um, I believe that would um, put a, maybe Rep. Rep. Representative Freeman, um, I think Director Freeman would actually be better to talk about that financing if he is still in the office. Freeman. Uh, Madam Chair and members, again, Jeff Freeman, uh, Executive Director of the Public Facilities Authority. So um, the federal dollars that have been appropriated for uh, the, the bipartisan infrastructure law, 43 million per year for five years. So 215 million roughly is available on the federal side. That's That amount is set. Um, that uh, five years clearly will be able to make a, a dent in the, the issue, but we will not address all of, we will not be able to remove all of the lead lines, and that's why this bill sets a 10 year goal. Um, you know, I, I've heard numbers of the health department a few years ago did a, a study uh, estimated 100,000 lead service lines in Minnesota. Um, I, I think there's probably a few less than that now, but that's probably still a pretty good number. Um, the current uh, cost estimates appear to be in the range of eight to ten thousand dollars per line. Now we hope that as this work gets going, as as cost efficiencies and um, our and construction efficiencies are developed, maybe that number can come down. But if you take ten thousand times. 100,000, you get to a billion dollar total. Um, you know, the, the, the big question in my mind, because we're looking at funding these projects, is how fast can this work actually be ready to go? You need engineers to design, you need cities to, to develop the project plans, you need contractors to do the work. Um, so we're looking at this, we, we know that for this first year list, as I mentioned, we've got enough money, but that will quickly change as, as momentum picks up. So I don't, have a, um, I don't have a number for you other than the really the macro number and then kind of what we know on a per year number and um, some of it, they, they, what's in between that, we're gonna somewhat have to learn as we go. 
And Madam Chair, one of the reasons why this number is higher is because, well, inflation, but also construction costs have gone up quite a bit and higher than other aspects. And so it is, it's a, it's a big number, um, but that is the cost. The other thing as part of that um, health department deport, report, excuse me, that um, Director Freeman mentioned, it also says that there is a two to one return on investment for every dollar spent on lead. Um, abatement in the state of Minnesota. So there is a return on investment. We will see that with better health up, better health outcomes um, and better property values. Thank you, Rep. Jordan. I believe Kasnick, do you have more questions? If you don't mind, um, just, just to kind of clarify, the federal dollars that are in the infrastructure bill, I think is like 668 million. Is that just for lead service line replacement or are there other areas that w the state could uh, use those funds. Uh, We're going to ask Director uh, Freeman to explain that more. Sure, so so the, the, the specific dedicated money for lead service lines is $43 million a year, 20, over five years, $215 million. Thank you so much for clarifying that. that my numbers were not quite clear on that, but that's perfect. Uh, I appreciate it, and I know this bill has a couple other committee stops that maybe we can finalize and get those details down a little bit, but that was very helpful. I appreciate it. Thank you, Lead Kosnick. Any other questions? I see none. Uh, Chair renews her motion that House File 24 be re referred as amended, be re referred to Health, Finance, and Policy Committee. All in, the, all in favor of that motion, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Congratulations, Rep. Jordan. You are on your way to your next stop. Thank you for stopping by this committee. Thanks for having me. All right. Well, I think with no further businesses, we are adjourned until next time.